Good morning. I think I got it. I think I got it. I was over there trying to get everything ready. I've got it all automated and timed. And then, of course, if something goes a little, just a little snag, like if I trip on my shoelace uh, back in the control room, I might be out here late. But I looked over and I saw the stop motion of the stuff, of the tools moving. And I said, I better turn around and face the camera. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Monday Methods. I am Bradley McAllister. It is a nice, cool morning down here in South Georgia. All right. Now, the one thing I didn't get to do because I was running out of time is I got to go back over there into the control room real quick and turn on my Facebook feed on the monitor that's up above so that I can make sure that everything is coming through the way it's supposed to. So to, while I'm doing that, I'm going to give you a beautiful shot of this piece of sycamore that we're going to be working on today. So let me go back over here real quick and make the change that I may need to make on the one monitor for myself so that I can see if there's some kind of a crash and burn throughout the course of the morning. Of course, we don't want that to happen. But it looks like we're going to have her up here and running here in a second. Yeah, 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 that's all good. There we go. And of course, I was typing, I was typing on the wrong keyboard over on the uh, input for the chat room. And of course, some of the keys don't work on that old laptop. So it didn't quite go exactly like it was supposed to. But, all right. So now I'm set. I can see what's happening on Facebook up there. I can see my monitors down here. I can see my chat room. Good morning. Uh, Oh, that's me up there. Good morning, Rich. How you doing? And you like the music? Uh, I'm always working on new things. Uh, good morning, Jim Haynes. Uh, it's a beautiful day down here in South Georgia. It's finally cooled off. It was in the 40s this morning. It's wonderful. I don't need the fan. I don't need AC. Uh, it's perfect. I'm short-sleeved, long pants, shoes and socks. It's a perfect day for doing some wood, coloring, uh, wood turning and coloring. Um, and I'm going to mention this a couple times, not trying to be salesy, but I thought I'd try something new here with Monday Methods. <clears throat> and what I want to do is whatever the topic is, uh, offer discounts uh, in the store for whatever the topic of the day is. And today the topic is really coloring. So in the Spiralcraft store, there goes my voice. It's kind of funny when it does that um, up here on Q4. If you go to the Spirecraft store, everything in the colorants category, and I can't scroll that from here, everything in the color, colorants category is 15% off today with the code color. Okay, now I'll mention this again. I'll pop back in here again, uh, you know, when I remember, I remember to do this. But it's just a little, a little something extra for those of you who come and join me here on Mon Monday Methods. So what I'm showing today are colorants, what I'm using after I turn this piece. So, discount code in there for color. It's only good for today. It's a one day only. I thought I'd give this a try, see what the feedback is like. Um, so, it should be interesting. <clears throat> Got any questions about the colors? If you have any trouble after the fact, let me know. Okay? So, enough of that for now. Um, let me grab the piece. And it's kind of funny with the way the... Between the time change and the angle of the light, the lighting in the room, lighting in the film studio here has changed. And I, I'm going to have to start readjusting in the last minute. I see some shadows on myself and on things that I didn't have before. Uh, so that's just part of it. Now, in a little, in a little bit of time, I'm going to have this wall in front of me uh, sealed off. It'll be drywalled. So the light from all the windows in the control room won't be coming in here. And there's a window to my left that will be blocked. And I've already blocked the window to my right. Trying to get control on the light. Light is, is one of the hardest things in doing uh, film, and especially in these live streams and whatnot. Uh, so all the fun little things that go with it. So today, today, here is the little inspirational piece. I made this a long time ago. Uh, just a, something for fun. But I really like the type of finish that's on here. And let's see. Uh, Frank came in. Good morning from Tennessee. Uh, Mark Thompson, good morning from Arizona. Maria, good morning. Hope you all are doing well. So this piece got, this is my inspiration for today, for the shape. All right. And I already took the, uh, 
the liberty of knocking the big corners off of this piece of sycamore, but I want to show you another piece. When Chromacraft first came out with the Accent Paste, uh, which is one of the products I'll be using today, the Accent Paste, some Chroma Gill, and the pearlescent powders that are typically thought of for being used in resin casting. We're going to actually dry brush those on. But this little piece right here was the first piece that I ever used this on. And this is just a, a just some little lidded box. You know, I never even really finished it. It's nothing fancy uh, by any means. But it was the first time I played uh, with these creams, and I kind of really liked uh, the look I got. And another thing that's nice about this is that if it's not the greatest piece in the world, if you've got tear out and things like that, um, it's okay. It hides the, the texture, actually blends. We're trying to assimilate, not, not duplicate a piece of pottery, but we're trying to get close uh, to the look of a piece of Raku pottery. That's kind of the goal. Um, you, the more you work at it, the more texture you put in there, and the more colors, the more time you spend playing with the different colors, then you're going to get you're going to get closer to that look. Uh, one of the issues that I have here in a live stream, of course, is it takes time for different layers of creams and gilts and whatnot to to dry, and so I kind of have to work with that or deal with that. I don't have the time to go away for an hour or two and let it that coat dry and come back, so I kind of have to work with that. Uh, Larry Jordan, good morning. I'm going to set this piece back over here. Hope you're doing well, sir. So, again, this piece, you know, it's just something I turned. I don't know when, where, how, and it's hollow. But if we look here, I had, oh, I'll show you in a second, uh, back to overhead. This is, is very similar in size to this blank that I've got roughed up here. This is a piece of sycamore. Uh, this is set in the end grain fashion. Um, as an end grain hollow form. So this is pretty close to the same size. So I think that'll work out well. I, I had this plan I was thinking about, and I'm going to set this right here for the moment. And, and again, I'm not claiming that's any fantastic uh, super duper shape, but it's kind of cool in its own way. Um, I, I was I rooting around my, my collection of stuff, and I thought, well, maybe I would take this one, which is pretty big, and finish it out and I decided well that's a lot and I haven't I don't actually turn it so I thought you know we're kind of getting cheated because uh, you want to see the turning go on as well so I thought about this one which is we'll finish this project one of these days and then I have another one left over from a Monday methods and this is actually two pieces this one would be perfect so here's where this piece splits right here so this is one piece and then this will be another piece and I need to reclaim my face plates one of these days uh, that's kind of one of the reasons I was thinking about using these. I started wondering where my bigger face plates were, and I realized they were still on these pieces. Uh, so this doesn't have to, this process doesn't have to be limited to something this small. It just takes longer and takes more material uh, to work with. So that being said, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to make a tendon. So like I've got I've got this in the sorby chuck, and I've got the little. Uh, it looks like inch and a quarter. Uh, step drive in there and I and I got it roughed into the round and it's not a super fancy Get on there three. Uh, it's not a super fancy piece of wood. It is ambrosia, but hey, so so be it um, Just because of the way it is it wouldn't have made it they're like ultimate things people might sometimes say How can you color a piece of wood like that? Well, this is, is pretty it changes it's got a lot of variance in it So this as far as I'm concerned is a perfect piece to color. All right. Uh, so that's what we're going to work with. Uh, as usual, I'll work with conventional tools, the Carter and Son. Uh, <laughs> more coffee. The Carter and Son, the Sorby tools, the Easy Wood tools, uh, the usual array that I use out here to, uh, to make the shape. But the first thing I want to do is go ahead and get a tendon on this guy, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to set this piece off to the side so that I don't break it. I'll give you that overhead while I walk out of the way here. Plus I need a little sip. Every time I come out here, I remember that because I, I'm, I don't get out here during the week, uh, the rest of the time and the weekends, that I need to buy a new grinder because I bent the spindle on my grinder. So when I have sharpened tools, the wheel's all over the place and that's just kind of crazy. Though I did sharpen some tools up real quick. So let's put a, let's put a, uh, a tenon on here. 
And we're going to use the easy chuck with uh, two and three eighths. I do believe. The reason being, I, I want a pretty strong tendon on this because I'm going to have this thing kind of cantilevered out there. So I'm just double checking that my caliper's in the right spot. It is. And we'll hide this over here for a little while. One of the things that's interesting um, about doing a, a chroma key presentation like I have here is that everything that's shiny turns uh, can have the key in it, can have the, the image. So like the hand wheel here, I'm going to paint that flat black. I'm going to paint my spindle black. I know the truck manufacturers would get mad if I painted their trucks black, but I would love to because sometimes they do strange things. Hey, Frank Byers just popped in. Good morning from Woodcraft Corp. Hope you're doing well, Frank. I'm out here on a wonderful day in Georgia. All right, so two and three eighths. Uh, tenon on this guy. I don't have a preference on which end. This one looks a little truer, so we're going to go with, with that. Now, one thing that's going to happen, because the piece is, is kind of long, um, I'm going to end up having to adjust the cameras during the presentation today, because neither of them are set up perfectly for, for uh, all the shots. Uh, so I'm going to come right in here and make the tandem, and I think, because that the, the overhead shot here doesn't give you a great shot of the end. The end shot, that uh, kind of, sort of. But there's, the light shines a little bit further down, and I don't want to adjust that camera and lose this. So I think I might just go ahead and leave it out here on the front camera, like so, uh, while, I, while I bust this tenon in here. Now for this, uh, I'm going to use the Easywood tools, the square tool, the rougher as they call it. I just call it the square tool uh, to make my tenon. This is my favorite tenon making tool. So that's all cool. And... As always, if you've got questions today, put them in the chat box. I can see folks are on YouTube. I can see folks are in Facebook. Um, so everything's working. Uh, the, that automatically scrolls for me. So that's real cool. I think I'm good to go here. And we're right at center already. So that's a good part of life. I don't know what the speed was when I was uh, turning this before. I used a spindle roughing gouge, but this it had the big corners. And this, this piece of wood, um, it said 1111 on it. I can't believe it's that old, but it could be. So there's about 1,000 RPM. And I'm just going to start coming in here. And I'm going to make one pass. I'll show you this on the end, even though it's not the greatest shot. I just want to kind of clean your face up. And I know you can't really see it once I get in there. One of these days, I'll, I'll invest in uh, PTZ cameras, pan, tilt, zoom, that will actually have a decent autofocus. But until then, I don't want to change the cameras more than I have to. So I can't come in because I'm not on a faceplate. I can't come in from the end. So I'm coming from the side, which is a little bit different than my norm. So that's perfect. It just goes, and I'll go to the end camera. This is all I do. This is my calipers. You see that's a, just a perfect fit right there. So that's how I go about that. So now that I've got my diameter set, and I like to only use half of this cutter. Now, I know you can't quite see it, but what I'm after is using the cutter, the cutter here, the, the width of the cutter as the length of my tendon, because that perfectly matches my jaws. That's why I love this tool. But I know I'm going to be using the easy wood tools uh, for my tendons. So there's my diameter and my depth. I'm going to put my little 10 degree dovetail on here. 
Again, this camera's not set for the end, end yet. Once we start hollowing, then I might adjust it, but I don't want to adjust it any more than I have to. And I want to make sure it's slightly concave. Standard protocol. Get right in there, but don't turn the steel. Okay, that, uh, that dovetail's not super smooth, Bradley. Let's see if we can't make that a little bit better. Come around here real quick. Georgia the whole day through, just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. You're right, you're right. Frank, are you up in Ohio? Is that correct? Okay, there we go. Our tendon is good, it's ready. We're set to jet with that. Let's go ahead and change things around. I'll go to front camera. We'll get everything turned around here. Change chucks. And we'll get to working on our shape. Ow, ow, don't do that. I've just recovered my finger recently. And let's go ahead and take this out. Um, from that mishap with the triangle piece, so I don't need to be putting my elbow into the tailstock. I've got my toolbox coming together over here. Starting to get organized. It's a scary thought if I get organized. Gotcha. Gotcha, Frank. You live in Ohio, working Parkersburg, West Virginia. All right. Do, 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 do. I'm looking forward to a good day. When I start humming first thing, that means I'm off to a good start, at least in my head, unless something goes south on me. So, Rich, I don't know if you're listening. Um, you knew that I wasn't kidding when I was talking about my chuck always being, uh, doesn't rust because it's covered in dye and resin and God knows what else. That is the truth. Now this piece is probably is longer, I know it is longer than what I want it to be or need it to be. So we'll kind of figure that out, what we're going to do here. But I got a plan because I don't, I don't want to, I don't really want to part this away if I can help it. Uh, Frank, yeah, I'd love to come visit sometime at the shop. All right. So I did not make this piece overhead. I did not make this piece perfect. There's, a, you see the flat in here, because I knew that I was going to be shaping this. Um, I've been one from my my art and craft days of. I don't put any more time into the piece at a certain stage than I need to. I mean, you can if you want to practice with your spindle roughing gouge and make it all nice and perfectly, a nice perfect cylinder, and then go ahead and put a bunch of curves in it. That's cool. Um, but from my art and craft days when I had to turn all week long and sell the stuff on the weekends, uh, if, I didn't ha if I don't have to do it, you know, it just got passed up. So that's why you see you see some flat spots like that sometimes in my pieces uh, when we're in this rough stage. I actually made that tenon a little bit bigger than I w would have normally, but that's okay. But I did want a good strong tenon um, because I got so much uh, extended out here. I, I could have gone to the inch and three eighths, but I know I've got waste here, so I'm not worried about that. That's going to be my the bottom land of things. Let's see how this turns. No, it doesn't like that. So, didn't find the true center. So what I do when that happens, and I, I messed up and I put the uh, tailstock in, I didn't really find the true center. I'll just come over here real quick like and cut that center away that I just made. And it doesn't really matter what I use. So what happened, I'll show you here on the end camera if you can see it. No, it's in the shadow. I got a strange shadow going on here on the end of this today. You can't quite see that. 
that's that's unfortunate. Uh, I'm just going to turn this turn this center away. That non-centered center, so that my live center will center. Don't call the safety police on me for not putting on my my uh, face shield for that one little quick quick shot. You couldn't see it actually that I didn't have it on. There we go. All right, I think that'll do the trick. Now this might be, uh, as Bridget tells me, too much information, but if you see me hiking up my pants today, it's because I forgot to put on a belt. So I apologize if I look like my pants are falling off. They're not. They're just sliding down. Yeah. Okay. So we got our. We're between centers. Life is good. We got her in here nice and snug. Everything is snug down. And I think the best shot right now is going to be this overhead shot. And let's see. We've got any other questions in here? And da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, as soon as I carve this away, it'll be cool. It'll get light on it. I'm not sure why it's acting so dark. But we'll, uh, we'll fix that real quick. Okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm, ha I'm happy today. I think it's because I've, I've been out here so hot and miserable, you know, so many days. Um, and now it's nice and cool and all that. So I can use any of my tools to shape this, start to shape this corner, uh, the top of this thing. It doesn't really matter what I use. Um, I can use my spindle gouges, I can use my bolt gouges, I can use the carbide tools. It really doesn't matter. Whatever you got, it's all cool. Now, here's one thing that I'm going to tell you about a project like this. We actually do not want this thing to be perfect, right? We want it to have a little bit of textural character without having to go over the top on our own. Um, so, not that we want lines around it, um, and big huge tool marks, but we might put some beads on it or who knows. But we don't, I'm not going to sand this thing. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to rough it up. I'm going to abrade it. Uh, I'm not going to sand it smooth. I'm going to make it rougher than the tools cut it uh, before we start to put the color on. <laughs> you must be happy because my pants are loose. Uh, well, there's something to that. There's something to that. Although the scale still lied this morning, Frank. So anyway, let's get, let's get safe here and go to the overhead for you on number three. See, and I can pull my pants up when we're on the other cameras and you guys can't see me looking like a buffoon. And, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't do a lot of spindle turning per se. So this is one of my places to kind of practice. And I'm going to take a spindle gouge and see if I can't abuse this piece of wood. It's a half inch Carter and Son spindle gouge. Got a little rattle somewhere around here. Not sure where it's at. But if it doesn't bother you, I won't let it bother me. So now in the end camera, now that it's getting the dark cut away, you can see a little bit better as I come around the corner here. So, you know, I don't have an exact shape in mind. Something similar to that other piece. But I have to admit that when it comes to, to a, you know, Hardcore heavy-duty planning in my turning. I'm not one of those uh, I like to just kind of get in there and go and see see how it goes Go ahead and just clean this up. We don't. I don't know how big our, our entrance is going to be or anything yet.
But I do know I want to put some profiles up here on the top. Give myself a little more speed here. So that's the problem. So this is, it's so funny this, in this project. So here's this wonderful, perfectly smooth cut. I mean, this is sweet, right? I don't think I'd sand that. I would start with about 200, 320 maybe, if I was going to sand that at all. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rough that thing up. So it's kind of funny. Uh, what size spindle gouge and grind am I using? It is a half-inch Carter & Son. And it is whatever is left of the original factory grind. I honestly don't know, um, Don, what what angles I've got on it. Uh, I'm not even sure what their their factory angle is. It's just that's where it started, and I just kind of resharpened. It's a little bit different. Um, it has migrated a little bit over time. Uh, again, I you know I'm not. I don't spend a lot of time with the spindle gouge, so I don't get real deep on it. Uh, I like to play with them to learn how to do them, use them better. Uh, so, by so, I, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I don't get caught up. Uh, that's one thing. Let me pop up here real quick. I'm I'm not one who gets real caught up in in angles and bevels, and this is a personal thing. It's just my personal preference. I started turning at 45 degrees on my bowl gouges. And I've just kind of always stayed there. So not to say that there's not, and I, don't, I hate to go down the rabbit hole of, of uh, angles and bevels, but somewhere around 45 is what I turn on my bowl gouges. I know all these other ones are, are really cool, but that's what I learned on and I'm comfortable with. And so I don't check, I don't check the angles. Uh, and that's, you know, it's probably bad. I can't tell you what it is. Um, hey, Brian. Uh, but that's just the way I am. And that's why you don't hear me talk about uh, what the grind is on my tools very much because I really don't pay a lot of attention and I know that sounds kind of strange uh, from a professional wood turner but if it if it's working and it, it works for me I'm happy I don't really get too caught up in what it is uh, when I get a new tool if I don't like if it doesn't work I'll shift it one direction or the other and to find where it works for for me and in my physical frame etc uh, and I guess my technique, and I move all along from there with it. And when they quit working, sometimes they go too far, and then I realize I have to take them back to a different uh, profile. But I don't, I don't get too carried away in there. So that's about the best non-answer answer that I can give you, um, uh, Don. But it is Carter and Son. Uh, it's fantastic steel. I mean, I don't sharpen these things very often because they don't really get dull super fast. And again, I don't turn them over. Um, Rich says the Carter and Son is 40 or 45 under roughing gouges. Hey, Barbara Hahn, long time no see. Thanks for joining in today. We're playing in the Chromacraft world, and I know, I know you know all about this. So now I'm now I'm all nervous because Barbara, Barbara hangs out with that guy named Nick Agar, and uh, she learns all kinds of cool things from him. So now I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to fly right, Barb. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. All right, let's get back to what we're doing here. Get back on the end. And a little bit more goofing off here. I'm thinking that I'm going to make the opening. Probably somewhere right in that area. All right, so like if I wanted to define that, I, one thing I do like to do is kind of define things for myself. So I might take this little detail tool from the uh, carbide easy wood tools and say this is, this is my opening. Okay, so in here, Goes back into a shadow there, I realize. So that's going to be my opening, let's say. All right. So it's kind of cool to leave this little profile here. And again, it looks like a shadow is showing there. All right. So I go, well, okay, I got that. 
I know it's hard because it again I'm gonna rough this up so it's kind of funny but it's also good practice to uh, work on you know making your cuts nice even though you're gonna turn around and, and and rough it up with a piece of I think I got some 60 grit over there that I'm gonna use to texture this Bradley's fancy uh, texturing methods okay So I think for now that works for that. Okay. So now I got to think about this. What do I want to do? I got that flat right there, but we're we're just now getting started on this. Let's see. Let's go to the overhead for you. And I'm gonna raise this up a little bit more. And believe it or not, work with what you're comfortable with. So I'm actually going to grab a little ball gouge here. Actually, you know what? Because I'm playing with all the tools today. So that was the spindle gouge. Uh, I'm going to use a carbide round cutter and do some more shaping here. So I do need to lower that back down. Uh, I like to use them all, all the different tools. And I, I do like, I have to confess, I, have to, I like using these round cutters, uh, the round carbides, for just kind of making the sh making up a shape. Because I can just go back and forth and do whatever it is I want to do. And so as I think about it, and I'm trying to decide, remember, I'm not trying to replicate this piece, but uh, for those of you who may have just jumped in, do you want to buy it from Spotcraft almost half the price, Jim says. Uh, so here's, here's kind of what I, this is my inspirational piece, but I, you know, I'm not going to duplicate this, but this is just what I was coming from. Um, and for those of you, I see you talking about the, some price of things out there. If you weren't here in the beginning, I'm going to show you this real quick uh, because today is colorant day out here in the Spirecraft store. Go to Spirecraft shop, shop.spirecraft.com, go to Spirecraft shop, and all the colorants, everything in the colorant category that you see there when you first go to uh, the website with the code color is 15% off today. So essentially that's everything from Chromacraft. Um, anything that's in that colorant category, and I can't scroll the page down because the computer's over in the control room, um, you can say 15%, just put in the, the code color and tap on colorants and any of the things, and there's a whole bunch of different things in there. All the products that I'm using today are in there, uh, along with the dyes, uh, the Rustina, uh, the airbrush paints, all kinds of things. Anything that's in the colorant category today, use the code color. And get you 15% off. That's good through, it, it'll probably expire at midnight, something like that today. Um, okay, back to the overhead. Let's see here. Uh, what do I want to do with this guy? Let's go. Let's go surfing now. No, I'm not going to sing to you. I think I want to put a little more profile right in here. Change that profile. Take some of this excess wood out of the way. Now we're going to have a stem down in here. We're going to have a long stem down in here. And because I'm not playing favorites today, I'm going to go jump back to that spindle gouge. Honestly, just for my own practice.
just to have fun with it. Okay. When you're trying to move a lot of material, it's all not maybe not necessarily the best choice. And you know, I could just reach over here and I took the handle off of that. If I just wanted to move some wood, just grab a big old bowl gouge. When I was turning and selling, turning all week and selling the art and craft shows and all this, all I had was bowl gouges. It's what you're used to, what you're comfortable with. Although I always strongly encourage to try new things, try different things, try different tools, uh, experiment with them. You might not like them at first, and then you might find that they they do something for you. Okay. So regardless of what you have, and that's why I say I like to change them up. Because not everybody has a rack with $4,000 worth of tools in it. Uh, let's see, for Brian, a couple years ago, I gave a tip on a few holes, ventilation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you guys are talking about the face mask, which I'm still trying to get the other ones to come in or be able to get them. Drill some extra holes right in here. And uh, I just take whatever size, drill, quarter inch drill bit or whatever, and drill a bunch of extra holes right in here and it stops me from fogging up and all that kind of stuff. All right, back to here. Got to keep track. I'm trying to keep this to an hour for the shape and then an hour for playing with color. Okay, so... I need. To, I want to leave this fairly strong. I don't want to make this super thin stem down here yet. So I'm going to make it about as, as uh, small as I, I, I dare for now. Okay. Now a lot of this will all get this will get turned away after the fact. Um, Generally speaking, I'm okay with this outside shape for what I'm doing today. Um, I will change it some. Now what I'm going to do, and I may change this in camera now so that you guys can see better because we're going to go inside. Uh, I don't have the steady rest hooked up, so I hope this thing doesn't. Now see this texture? I don't know if you can see this or not. Using... And the folks, the easy one might hate me, but using the carbide tool, I get uh, some 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 extra extra texture here. And for this particular project, that's okay. As a matter of fact, I'm going to rough it up with, like I said, 60 grit paper. So it's it's an okay thing. Yes, I could. I even with the carbide tool, I could clean that up and make that go away. Uh, but I don't really. I don't want to. I, I want the texture, okay? So, maybe what I can do, let's see, you, you are on the over, overhead at the moment. I'm going to adjust, I'm going, I'm going to, I love the way when the, uh, it automatically closed captions this stuff. And I say I'm gonna, or I'm going to, but I don't say I'm going to. I say I, I'm gonna because I live in South Georgia. I'm going to make an adjustment here on this camera. And things might wiggle a little bit for a minute. But that's the way it is. And change that focus to... And see if I can't get you in here a little bit better. Again, one of these days, the upgrades, but I'm not going to go out and buy some $29 PTZ camera. So I want it to be good stuff, so I'd rather just take a few minutes here and kind of adjust. And that looks a little bit better right there. What do you think? It's going to be a little dark just because, like I said, the way the lights are working today, they're kind of giving me 
they're being difficult for whatever reason they feel like. All right. Now, before I go crazy on this, uh, we are on the end camera. I'm going to actually double check that this is nice and tight because what can happen is when you, I tightened this up once before, right, when I started. And if you retighten the chuck, your piece can shift a little bit. So before I've committed completely to all the shape, especially going inside, I'm going to tighten this up the one last time. And this is compressing some, but now it's finally starting to, to hold up. All right. So we're going to leave that alone like that. Okay. Trying to figure out where I want to put my controller here. Uh, I think that'll work. That shouldn't be uh, in the way. All right. Here's our end shot. Uh, try using negative rake cutters. Uh, what do I want to use a negative rake cutter for, Frank? I'm trying to make it rough. I, I don't want it smooth. <laughs> I want to rough it up. I'm going to rough it up, beat it up. And come up a little bit here. Number one hollower. Easywood Tools number one hollower. Uh, every Easywood Tools turning turner's favorite tool of theirs. Uh, it, I use it for everything and then some. <laughs> gotcha, never mind. That's why I said, Frank, this is kind of one of those counterintuitive projects. You don't want it smooth. And it's really hard to do as a wood turner. Your brain says, I got to make this nice. I got to make a nice cut when in reality it doesn't matter because you're going to turn around and carve it or sand it or do whatever you're going to do to it. All right. Let me get a quick sip here over. It looks like you can kind of see in there, okay? And again, this piece isn't, it's nothing fancy we're doing here today. Hopefully this doesn't vibrate too much. Probably going to get some. And yes, I could, you know, I could drill this out and all that, but I'm not going to. That was, does seem like it, uh, as far as tight as that is, it, that vibration grabbed that. I know that I have it as tight as it's going to get, and that's why I left this, put a big tenon on this guy. Although it does act like I almost knocked it out around there just a little bit. I know I did. Again, this would be a good time to have the steady rest up, but it's over in the other shop. So we'll just go kind of gentle on it. We'll have to, we'll return this outside after I've done this. Because we do want it to at least be round. And I may not completely hollow this just for time. Because I can always leave it on the tenon and come back or, or not if I don't finish it. If I can get in here and get it done, though, I'll do it. I can really reach way down in there with this tool. I do love this thing. So I just keep cutting my, the nub away inside there. So how far down in there am I? I'm about about to the almost to here. And I'm actually reaching out into the corner. See the angle the tool's sitting at there? And if I show you in the overhead, I'll show you what I'm doing so that I don't have to use the curve tool. I hate changing tools. So I'm actually reaching over here at an angle and 
using this, this tool because that way I'm just using one tool. Now I will grab a curved tool with a swan neck on it in a minute, but if I can not change tools, it makes it faster. That's where, you know, when I used to have to said, had to turn all day long. I didn't like changing tools if I didn't have to. If I could do it with whatever was in my hand, that was all good. Okay, so you can see how much angle I'm swinging on that. Now let's go ahead, as I said that, and uh, I'm going to uh, grab the swan neck style tool. And I prefer to use, which one am I on the end, overhead, I prefer to use the, the bigger, the number three, um, the easy wood tools, they call it the full size. This tool is no longer available, the full size number three. Easy wood tools full size number three is now the pro number three hollower. Um, I, had, I had one left that went to, I don't know if Mary Alice, if you're in here today or not, and Mary Alice got my last one. This is kind of my favorite. It's uh, this is the steel is the same as the full size or the number three pro, um, but got a little bit smaller handle. It's a good size. I got a good thick shaft here. It does good work for me. Uh, I'm happy with it. And I'm going to use this to reach in and come out to my corners, right up to. So you can see I've just. I'm just sitting on the flat there. And now I can reach around the corner without having to, to uh, be over, way over the lathe. Now one of the keys with these tools is you want to cut right here off the end. You don't want to cut here. You want to be cutting right here. Okay? Now if you cut here, it'll vibrate a lot. So what you do is you swing the tool inside the piece. So if you see me go down the wall, and then as I, as I go around, I'll swing the tool so that it's still cutting off of the very tip, okay? And I can go back and forth. And we can go on and on and on in here. Like I said, uh, I'm, you know, I don't think I'll hollow all the way. Plus, I'm going to make the stem pretty small down here, so I'm leaving extra material. Swing that tool around. Okay. Come back up. Yep. Okay. Now, I am going to go a little bit further because it looks like on the screen it's 11.52. Uh, it won't take me too much longer. 11.50. I'm going to give myself a couple more minutes inside here. And then we're going to go to the outside, finish the outside shape so we can start playing with colors. So I took that inside section to here away. Now I'll step on past this center point and so I don't have the uh, leverage putting on the outside on the very end and so the wood because the wood will start to move as you cut it away down below so see, when you see the tool jump it's just hitting the center the center nub And I just go right underneath the nub and lift up. And another thing I want to show you, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, I hold these tools a little bit differently than a lot. I don't hold them, this is just me, I don't hold it by the handle back here. I hold the tool as an extension of my entire arm. Get back over here in the center. So when I'm, when I'm turning, I've got my whole shoulder. So my elbow is underneath, is on top of the handle. And I have my full body. And so that's what I'm doing when I come over here. And if you, I don't know if you can see me or not. When I find that nub, 
I can just get underneath it and just cut right up on it and it doesn't do anything to hurt my wrist. I have, I guess I've hurt my wrist before. So this, my wrist is always, now my hand is all jacked up and the doctors tell me that I need surgery and I do, but you know, I, I'm not going there. So anyway, that's uh, one thing about how I hold these tools differently uh, than a lot of folks do. All right, take a little bit more out of the inside here real quick. Now that we went down in there, and again, I'm not going to hollow all the way down in. That should be good right about there. Rotate that tool around. And again, you're limited here uh, by how deep you can go with a certain tool by the length of the swan, okay? So you can see here, I'm still got about a half an inch that I could go. And I'm actually kind of trying to feel that nub with the, with the cutter this way, it's a little harder to do. We're going to call that good for the hollow part of this thing. All right, that's, that's hollow enough for our purposes today for a demonstration. That's all cool. I do want to, I do want to true this back up. Now, I, like I said, I know, Frank, don't turn me in. I actually like this texture that I was getting. I want that texture. So if it saves me a little bit of work, I'm going to take this carbide cutter. I'm just going to reshape this because it's a little out of round. Which camera I'm on? I'm on the overhead. Okay. Now like I said, I want texture but I don't want like a big tool mark or a big ridge. And I'm trying to look at my black, uh, you can't see it, uh, right over, if I go here, right over, you know, right over here, where I point, is the black top of my, my work table, and that's what I'm using to look at this profile, okay? Because I can't see anything down in here, not really. So I'm, I'm more concerned with the profile being nice, then it being smooth. And again, I don't want to spend all day on it. But I want to stop real quick and see if I have any, any big marks up in here. Tool marks that looks pretty well smooth. Um, and it is, it's nicely textured. There's a little bit of a line right here, which may or may not telegraph. That's what we're worried about is a, a, a line telegraphing. Uh, through the work with the color with the paste and the creams on it so let's make sure that's gone uh, let's do a little something up here with the tip the top because this is still when I knocked it out around it's not turning true and I'm just kind of winging this making this up here just putting some kind of little profile on this Again, we're not super zoomed in because it's kind of a long piece. Move this to respect, just a fuzz. One of these days, I will use up the 6,300 pounds of sycamore. Okay. And so now here's a, here's a, a $64 million question of your own. I've got a sharp edge on this now. Do I want to round this over? Do I want to leave it sharp? What do I want to do with it? Um, this is kind of cut into V-notch. I could come in here with the number one hollower with the small round cutter and I could radiate it, radius this, make a real nice radius, which I think I'm going to do. 
and then reshape this to match. I kind of like that look a little bit better. So I'm going to get rid of that line right there. Now I've got a nice little cove made right there. Now you could leave this line as a detail if you wanted to. Um, you know, that's the beauty of wood turning. You can do whatever you want to with this stuff. But I'm going to blend that away. Okay, there we go. And I'm just going to take the sharp edge off of this because I don't want to cut myself. So that's smooth enough now that I can put my finger on it. Okay. And I'm going to come over here and clean up the opening because it's a little out around. So we're going to clean that up real quick as I try to move. I'm trying to keep myself on time, on track on time, which is, is always a good practice. God knows when we get back out to going out on the road and you actually have to finish something by a certain time, it's kind of nice to, to uh, stay in practice. Okay, so that's cleaned up. Got a nice little top here. All right. Now let's hustle down through here and make finish our shape up. Sure, I'm where I want to be. And I'm just going to mow some wood away. I'm going to stay with this. Now actually, give me my bowl gouge here real quick. i got to move some wood. So I just soon grab my big bowl gouge. Now I could make a tenon and part this off and then remount it and all that stuff, um, but I'm not going to today. Okay, so just moving a bunch of wood real quick. You know, and I can switch over to the spindle gouge. Get myself in here just for, you know, just for practice and, and all that good stuff. Never hurts. I said I, you know, the bowl gouge is my buddy. We've been through thick and thin. Now, I can keep doing this with spindle gouge, but it's actually, and this is why in this particular project today, so I get this nice perfect cut right here, right? It's nice and smooth, and this side has got a little bit of lift, a little bit of, uh, it's not really torn out, it's just kind of, uh, it's raised up, which is what I want, all right? So, and I'm not trying to poo-poo the carbide at all. It's just the nature of, of, of doing it fast and not coming back and slowing down to clean it up. But for the shape that I want to do for, this, for the stem here, this is actually a faster, easier choice for me. And I, and I will get the text, texture that I want. And then the texture is important. So hopefully you can see the profile there. And let me get oh, on the right camera. And I'm just going to whip right down through here real quick. Now I've got a lot of extra uh, mass kind of up in the top here. I'm looking to get at my back, black background back over there for my, my, my shape. And I'm just going to keep carrying that, that funnel down. And I want to be sure that I'm happy up here. Because once this gets really thin, uh, turning up here is, is out of the question. You lose that opportunity. Art, you made it. You made it. Good to see you, buddy. I just want to beam myself over there with you. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, love to have you. Frank, if you're ever in South Georgia, give me a holler.
It's a little small here in the film studio and the workshop next door looks like a, a, a woodworking store exploded. It, but hey, that's where we work, right? Okay. Looking at the profile, oh, I'm happy to see I'm moving pretty quick. And again, I honestly, if I use my spindle gouge, I could cut a cleaner, flatter, smoother surface, but that goes against what I want to accomplish today. So I, I keep removing a little more material back here from the left-hand side to work on the profile. It's really a visual in my head, in my eye, my mind. And the question becomes, you know, how small do I want to make that? I mean, I can go along, I could go half that diameter. Uh, what's my time look like? Oh, I'm five minutes over. So we'll go just a little bit more. I kind of have to appease myself. I don't want it so fragile that while I'm hu hurrying today, uh, playing with the colors that I break it. All right. So we'll just leave it something like that. And now the next thing I want to do, and I, let's say I grab my parting tool. I put it so I could find it easy. There it is. I put it right up front. And I raise this tool rest up. And I just want to define where my bottom is going to be, my base is going to be. I'm thinking right about there. Uh, if you can see that line or not that I just cut with the parting tool. It's some, somewhere in there. So it's, that's why it's kind of handy. So like I say, let's grab a square tool just to help give me some definition. And I can say, okay, there's the bottom of my piece. So, and I can take a little bit more out. Now I've got my point to work to. All right, you can see it right up against the, right in here. All right. So now I can refine that any way I want. And again, I'm not gonna get carried away because I wanna play with the colors. Okay. And I'm not going to worry about the perfect ratio today. I do like my base to be a little bit smaller than the top up here, and it is. Um, I could argue with myself for a long time. And if you wanted to put uh, more detail anywhere along in here, you can. I'm just keeping this as simple as I can today. All right. And... The funny thing is, now that I look back up here, I don't like part of this profile right here. And we're going to see if I can make myself happy before we go to color, after I've taken that extra wood away. So it's going to be real uh, sketchy right up here. But it just had a little hump in it that bothered me. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to leave it with that. That's pretty straightforward. All right. That, um, that shape is not bad for, for a fun little piece here. I've got some nice texture, so I don't think I'm even going to have to kind of do the, uh, the 60 grit on here. I did pick up a little bit of vibration right here just from just now when I turned that. Uh, the flex in the piece, I got a little bit of tool mark right in there. And so that's my bad, but we'll call it part of uh, 
part of the pottery. Remember, we're trying to emulate pottery here today. Not duplicate. And don't get me on my, my uh, definitions. Or I'll get in all kinds of, kinds of trouble. We're not trying to make it exactly like a piece of pottery. But we want it to be similar. Now the one thing I want to do. And I have a piece over here. And I shouldn't need that. We'll see what happens. I'll, I'm going to put my little bed protector down here. It may change the, the uh, you get all these shadows. Sometimes it does strange things. And if I don't like what it does and it changes the, the color and the white balance, I may just make a mess on my lathe. I like that better. Okay. So much. This lathe bed, you know, it's not... Uh, it gets sanded. That's how I clean it up. I just sand on it. Okay, so you couldn't see those changes in the white balance in the other cameras. Um, it does weird things, and then you have to go change it because they're not on auto. So what do we have here today? Uh, the colors we're going to work with are Chromacraft Accent Paste, and this is actually a wax uh, style paste. Um, it does have some solvents in it. If you if you like toluene and organic solvents, uh, you'll love this stuff. There's a whole bunch of colors, lots and lots of I I've got looks like about ten different ones here. Some of them are dupes this morning. I just grabbed whatever I uh, could see uh, and find. So I have the accent paste, and I'll give you an overhead here. This happens to be referred to as gilding rose red. All right. Now, when it comes to colors, uh, here's one of the things with me with color. I will mess a piece up all day long just to play with the colors. Uh, so you, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. Let me show you uh, a rich gold, a uh, metallic blue, okay. And these things are really cool. And if I don't know if I had the bronze, here's a metallic. A gilding metallic green. All right, that's one of my favorites. That's on the other piece. Then I have the chroma gilt. These are the latest uh, Nick Agar signature creams, gilding creams from Chromacraft. They are a squeeze out of the tube type of cream. They work very well. They work differently than the waxes. Let me go back up here. Um, they work differently than the waxes do. Uh, they're thinner, they're creamier, uh, so it's just a different effect. We're going to play with all of them today. And then the other thing I have all over here, well, that's glitter. I guess I don't need that one, um, is pearl powders. So these are the Chromacraft pearl powders. Uh, typically, we mix these with resin. That's what they're typically thought of uh, for being for. This happens to be gold. These are real, real fine uh, mica powder pearl powders. And Chromacraft has some of the finest uh, pearl powders uh, going. I love these things. Uh, one of my favorite stories, this is actually uh, satin white. And I was going to show you an iridescent. There was a taxidermist out on, on the road at the Woodworking Shows last year. There was a taxidermist, and she was in the audience. And in taxidermy, they use the pearl powders to do all their taxidermy. And she had gotten a couple of the jars the day before, and she came back to the show and she said how much better she thought these were than what the taxidermy industry was selling to people um, in a pearl style powder or an iridescent or a, or a mica powder. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, back overhead here. So an iridescent gold, all the iridescents are actually white. Okay. They need another color to bounce off of. Let me see if I can find another one that will fool you in the iridescent. So here's an iridescent green. But it's white. But once we bounce it off of another color, then it will pick up its colors. All right? So those, the, the powders, we're going to put on uh, dry. So you can use a chip brush from your favorite supply hardware store. I happen to use that one that starts with Harbor Freight. Same place I get uh, anything that doesn't have moving parts. Uh, it tends to come from Harbor Freight, along with my gloves. Uh, artist brushes, various uh, shapes, sizes, densities, softness, hardness, and then uh, makeup brushes. Now, I don't know a thing about makeup. 
right? You get me? I don't know a thing about makeup. But uh, these makeup brushes, I don't know what they're called, ladies. You can, you can tell me. Uh, my wife will tell me. Uh, these are great for applying the powders uh, onto the surface, and we can just dry brush the powders in. So my plan here today is to add, uh, put a base color on here in the accent paste, and maybe another one or maybe a third one, build up some colors, maybe then add a little bit of chroma uh, gilt. Now again, I don't have the luxury of the waiting for it to dry, so I, I have to be careful because the colors may blend more than I want them to. If I was to put on the first color, let it dry, and then come back and put on the second color, um, it wouldn't blend together. But then again, sometimes you want those two colors to blend. So it's a fine line to walk. Uh, and then when I put the dry powders on with the brush, well, depending on how much brush pressure I use, I may inadvertently uh, blend some of the colors underneath, okay? So it's, it's a fine line. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experimental kind of thing. You, you can't go wrong. If you mess it up, let it dry overnight and start over with a fresh base coat. Uh, I mean, you could do the whole thing black and then start building up if you wanted to. Uh, so you, you really can't go wrong. You might just have to start over, all right? And I'm going to show you the end shot of this real quick so I can get a sip of water. Um, that's a nice, just a soft little rim up there. And uh, while I'm taking a sip here, because my throat is a little scratchy, let's see, Mary Alice is in. Good morning, Mary Alice. Good to see you. Uh, Robert Clark wearing that wedding ring, running a lathe is dangerous. Well, Robert, that's a chance I take. I don't take my ring off. Um, that's just me. Uh, everybody's entitled to do what they, how they feel. Appreciate your concern. Uh, Dan, Dan, uh, Dan, I'm trying, I know I can't pronounce your last name. I should. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for telling me I'm looking good. I'd like to think at least I'm trying. Okay. So, what color are we going to put on this for our base color? Well, I want to go, I think, I think, I think, I think. Let me look at what I got here. Metallic bronze. I think I'm going to go kind of dark and go up to lighter colors. All right. So I'm going to put on a glove, not that I, I mean, I'm going to end up with stuff all over the place. I'll probably put on a glove, and for this first coat, I'm just going to use the glove. And I'm going to coat the whole thing with this, all right? And I'm in the overhead, and you can see it just comes up on the, on the glove. And I'm going to start rubbing this in to the entire piece. And it's going to take a little bit. That's why you, you'll understand here. Let me go to end camera for you. You can see that better. Um, that I, I wanted to leave myself uh, plenty of time for putting the color on. I didn't want to spend the full two hours out here in the live stream today uh, just turning on the piece and trying to make the most excellent piece we've ever made. I was more, I'm more, much more interested in, in playing with the color and I've got the better part, well, I think about 45 minutes. You know, I've been known to run late. Those of you who hang out with me on a regular basis know I regularly run late. But some days I finish on time. So I'm going to move through here as quick as I can and just get this gold base on here. And while I'm doing this, I'm wide open to questions in the comment column there from anywhere um, on any topic. Again, if you didn't hear me earlier, I talked about in the Chromacraft, uh, not the Chromacraft store, in the Spirocraft store, all the Chromacraft colorants are on sale today at 15% off for today. Only use the code COLOR when you go to the store. Everything in the category of colorants is on sale. That's my plug. I won't beat you to death with it. And I don't have to use the same color on the entire thing. I could do something different. I may get bored with this color. And so now you know why I chose not to 
do a piece like this today. I would have been a long time covering this guy. If you missed that earlier discussion, um, I had thought about using one of the bigger pieces. I am glad I decided not to. And you know what I'm going to do here, just for fun? I'm going to do, I'm not going to do the bronze on the top, on the very, very top here. I'm going to, while I'm up here, no, I'll wait a minute. I'm, I'm thinking, thinking as I go here. Let's get all the bronze. I'm going to do some, I'm going to put black on that very top to make it really, really dark underneath. Again, this does go a long way. Now the texture, on, especially this first course, this first round, is kind of consuming a lot. Um, would a sponge put on, a sponge would put it on fine, uh, Maria. The, the thing is, you got to get it out of the jar. And at one point, Crumbcraft was talking about putting uh, putting this into larger larger jars. These little teeny, these are one ounce jars, and I think they were talking about going to a two ounce jar. So you still got to get it out of here, and then you could put it on a sponge. And I actually thought about that last night uh, using a sponge, and then I completely forgot to go look for one. So yes, you, uh, anything that you want to apply it with uh, is fine. And texture is one of those things. And, and what I'm, you know, what I'm here about, I, I'm not a carver in my wood turning. Uh, I say at least yet. Um, nothing wrong with it. But I like to see what I can do with a piece without uh, carving on it, without without doing anything extra in that regard. Uh, and that's just me. Okay, that's just me. I just haven't spent the time, haven't made the time, spent the time to learn how to work with the carving tools, haven't, haven't made the investment in the carving tools. Uh, Spirocraft will be selling the carving tools. Uh, I know you've been hearing this for, from me for a long time, but I am getting really close. In the new website, there is a carving category, and that's what I worked on all weekend, and it will be, it will be going... Uh, coming live pretty soon, just as soon as I can get everything doing what it's supposed to do. And I plan to bring some of the different carving, uh, power, power carving tools. Uh, Sorby has their hand chisels for carving. Uh, Spidercraft is a Sorby dealer, so we'll be having the, the Sorby uh, hand carving tools. We'll be having the power tools in there, power carving. I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> and once this dries, you can put a finish over it. Um, the finish is, that I recommend is the water-based urethane. It doesn't, it, it's, it's almost got no uh, sheen to it. It's, it's the WRU-20 uh, from Chromacraft. It's a water-based urethane. It's, it's, it's white. Um, when you put it on like most of the urethanes are, but it doesn't make it shiny at all. It doesn't make it flat. It just, it just seals up your, your work, okay? And doesn't leave anything else, any kind of a finished look on it. So it looks like it's still raw, but it is protected. Uh, so I really like that a lot. I would wait for it to dry before I do it, so I won't be putting that on this piece today. And we're moving down. We're, we're in the home stretch of the top piece here. And then I'll probably take a paper towel and kind of take the excess off of here. I mean, I've been I'm rubbing this into the, the texture pretty good. But I also, I don't mind, like in the next colors, um, I want this stuff to be kind of lumpy. Again, because I'm trying to make it look like something that's not exactly... Uh, to my pottery friends out there, I know that it can be nice and smooth, and it can also have a lot of texture. So I don't mean to offend that pottery is rough by any means. Barbara says, Would it make a difference if I sealed the wood before applying the color? Um, Barbara, on this, with the accent paste, I don't, I don't know. Um, 
it probably wouldn't so go in as much. Obviously, it wouldn't go in as much, uh, but the wood would be smoother. And so my first reaction, and I again, it depends on the look you want. My first reaction is I I wouldn't go there because I want it to be as rough as I can get it without it being beat up. Um, because if I seal it, I'm going to get uh, a smoother finish because the down in all these little fibers, they would have been uh, f smoothed over down in the bottom of the valleys, if that makes any sense. Um, so I might lose a little of the texture. Uh, I, I, to be honest, and with this accent paste, I haven't sealed it before and tried it and done an A-B to see what the difference was like. So that's, that's a, I don't know. I will let you seal, do a piece sealed and then a piece not sealed. And tell me what your findings are. Okay. Now, I could leave it uh, just lumpy like this, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. This first coat, though, I do want to, I'm going to rub this one down with a paper towel. Ahead of the next coat, because that will, this will help expose some of my texture back, okay? I love this kind of work because it is just experiment and trial and try different things and have fun. So I don't, the light is a little tough. Let me go over here. So now you're starting to see a little bit better um, how I'm, I'm getting it. Even though I, so I wiped this down. But you see the texture, uh, if you can see past the sheen. I have a nice texture in this piece, right? So it's, it's not really looking like a piece of wood, and I haven't done anything to it. I mean, all I did was turn it and, and not sand it, okay? So I'm taking all the extra gold off of there. Now, playing with color can be a really scary thing because it's a, well, when I used to teach the color with the dyes, um, and I would do club demos, and I, we would do it all day, and I'd play with the, the back then I was using the water-based dyes instead of the alcohol-based dyes, and people wanted to make it perfect right from the get-go, and I was very much into abstract uh, coloring with the dyes, and so I, you know, I was like, just, just let it go. Just be wild and crazy on it. And the worst thing that can happen is you have to dye the whole thing black. And then you still get a lot of colors uh, after the fact. So you just kind of have to be bold. Uh, again, this is not a controlled piece. I thought about a technique. I was going to bring out uh, some little, little uh, like say, uh, quarter inch, eighth inch tape and, and tape off a pattern on here which you could also do. I don't know how well it would work uh, with the texture, but I was thinking about experimenting with it. But I, I couldn't find it at the last minute, so I chose not to. So I've got some patina black here. We'll go to the end camera. And it's actually a silver. That's not as black as I want. Let me see. Uh, gilding black. That might be. I want a little bit darker. They're both a little on the gray side. I was thinking a little that there would be a little bit more black. So these are made more of a silver or a gray than a black black. I was looking, I was hoping for a black black, dark black, but I guess this is as dark as I'm going to get. I hope I'm not sticking my head in the way. So I guess it doesn't really much matter which one I go with. They look very, very similar in color. So let's go back to the end here. And... <laughs> sorry about that. The reason I'm going to do the black on the top, so the black, so-called black, is because that's what I want to put on the inside as well. All right, so that my piece is dark inside. 
and this, this glove doesn't fit in my finger like I want it to. Usually if I'm not in public, I don't wear a glove. Sometimes in public, I forget to put on a glove. So what you're going to want to do, and I might still put other colors up here on this top rim. I'm going to put color on this until the clock t uh, runs me out of here at 1 o'clock-ish, not straight up. Another nice thing about a project like this is you don't have to sand the inside. So I'm just going to throw some of this in here. <sighs> There's still sawdust in there. And try and get just a little bit so you can see the effect. You get the idea. You want the inside to disappear. Okay. So you would work that all the way down through there. And then you can still do any kind of... Uh, color that you want to uh, on top of that inside you know the world sky's the limit on this stuff okay so that's you get the general idea let me get that all smeared around in there and we'll leave that be now here comes the next question the hardest part next hardest part what is the second color what's the next the second color we want to put on this this bronze um, we can go we can go bold uh, we can go multicolors we can go subtle uh, so to give you a, an idea of what I'm talking about and I'll switch to the overhead camera here in a second I'm going to grab metallic green the rose red metallic blue and what else do I have here? Those are the three copper. Okay. And I'm going to try and set these up on here so you can see them with, they're not, with them not falling off. So here's the first two colors. Uh, that would be somewhat subtle. This is uh, a metallic green on the left and a metallic copper on the right. So that would make for nice uh, flowing subtle color blends, if you will. That's one option. And then there's an option for people sometimes like me who would like to use metallic blue and the rose red on top of that. Now, if I'm going to do the rose red and the metallic blue, and again, this gets into your color theories and just your own preferences, I probably would come in with some of the metallic green first. Um, and not cover the entire thing, but I'd probably put I'll probably put some metallic green on there. So here's where I'm going to go with this. Uh, I'm going to kind of take a quick poll here. There's a 20 second delay, and I'll take uh, answers for you know just a minute or so. If a preference of uh, a bright colors, pink and blue, basically on here, just rose red and blue as the main theme, or the more subtle. Uh, green and copper all right so let me know pop into your comment column don't be afraid to comment let me know what you're thinking I'm gonna take a sip of water we got a vote for green from art let's see Frank says go bold Maria says rose and blue. Brian says subtle colors. Mark says copper rose. Copper rose. Okay, that's an interesting. So copper rose is a combination as well. Uh, Derek Traub says bold. Rose and blue. Mary Alice says rose and blue. Uh, 
So it looks like without without my poll taker here, I'm so tired of polls. I'll be glad when I hope everybody's voted. If you haven't vote, I'm not political. Go uh, go off on any kind of politics. If you haven't voted, please vote. Tomorrow's a really important day. Uh, but I'm so tired of polls. I, I will be glad when this is over so I don't have to hear about the word polls again. Uh, plaid. <laughs> yeah, plaid. Uh, I don't think I have any plaid, uh, Sandra. Sandon. Sandon. Um, gosh. We're in, we're in the middle. Rose and green. All right. Rose and green. Rose and green. All right. How about if we do blue, copper, rose, and green? What do you think? We just use all four colors. And we just put them on, and they'll be in different places. They'll be scattered around kind of randomly. And it's, it's fun. It's an experiment. You build layers. You spread it around. And so you see what happens. So, that being said, I, I here's what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to use all four colors. If it's the ugliest thing I've ever made, I know how to fix it. It's called a coat of black, and we start over when it's dry. So I'm going to put some, start with some pink, and I'm probably going to go through. I, I'm just going to, I want to use my paper towel, but that's too hard to do. So what I'll try and do is I'll get another fresh glove and see if I can't use different fingers for this. And if I have to change gloves, Mary Alice says go for it. That's me. I'm not afraid to mess up. I'd rather see how it develops. Because um, if you haven't done it before, and I have, so I haven't played with this combination of colors before, right? So I really don't know what they're going to look like. So the only way to find out is to put them on and see what you get. That's why we do our, our test pieces, our learned pieces, our experimental pieces. And we come back and say, okay, that was cool. Uh, that was really stupid. I uh, like this. Well, that wasn't so nice. Uh, I got nothing to lose here. It's, it's fun. It's a piece of wood, right? It's not a big piece of wood. We don't have anything vested in it. So it's it just experiment, have fun with it. But what I think I want to do, I don't, want, I don't think I want the, the rose red to be overpowering. So I'm going to put this on as my first coat in, you know, just kind of around in a variety of places. And then I'm just going to make my next decision where I'm going to go. Because this is going to be pretty strong on here. Okay. And we're just going to go with it and see what happens. So let's see if, if I have, if I have four usable fingers on one hand. I could glove up the other hand, but I'll make a mess. Let's just do this. Let's go up into the top here. And just hold your breath with me on this. Because by the time we get done, so I'm just kind of applying it, you know, here and there. All right, just little splashes of it because it's a real powerful color. And there's going to be other colors going on top of it. And we may, uh, layering is one of the best things you can do. So you can come back and, and put more of another color on. And I'm going to kick that one that just fell off into the chips so it doesn't end up in the house. Now over top of that, my next color, I'm going to... Do something in between. I'm going to go with the green, the metallic green. I do love this color. Okay. And some of these I've had since they first came out. Uh, from, I mean, some of these jars are numerous years old. All right. So some of it's a little creamier, like this green is, is very creamy. The, the rose is um, a little drier. Uh, Frank, this is junk and scrap. What are you talking about? This is not good wood. 
This is the stuff I've been, had laying around forever. So you can see the green is real subtle. And I'll put that you know, a little bit here and there over top of that. A little bit up on the top. Then I'm going to go with the bronze. Bronze is on the next finger. And see, I got you on the... Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I had you on the uh, front camera. You can see a little bit better. I've got to try and stay out of the light here. You should have hollered at me that I was on the front camera still. You thought it was a genie in a bottle? Because what I'm going to do when I get all four of these colors on, I'm going to take that paper towel as my texturizer and blender, if you will. And I'm coming up here to the top as well. And actually, I'm going to do the blue next, and then I'm going to do another color again after the blue. Uh, before I, before I commit or to the paper towel, so don't worry about those splotches like that. Now we'll come over here to the overhead, and then you know with the ones I've done in the past. It, once you kind of blot it out, if there's something that's overpowering, well, then you add another color to take away from it. If there's a color that you want to jump back out, well, then you add a little bit more of that. And the, the idea here is not to cross-contaminate your, your containers, if possible, which can be kind of hard to do. But if you work at it, you'll be all right. So I know that this blue is, is, is pretty is pretty bold. All right, which I, I mean I'm all good with bold. But I'm gonna put another color over top of the blue. One of these original colors. And I'm gonna go back with now I don't remember which finger I used for which. Um with the the uh, copper. I'm going to go with the copper back over top of the blue, just a little bit in places, like so, just to kind of take the edge off of that blue. All right. Now it's looking like a spotted mess, right? And it kind of is. Hey, my wife, my wife put, chimed in. How you doing, sweetie? My wife Bridget, she pops in, reminds me of my favorite rose gold. All right, so I'm taking just a paper towel. Uh, this would be, uh, I think it was Maria asked about a sponge. A sponge would be great right here. Again, I just forgot about looking around for one. Um, a little sponge, uh, you could use the sea sponges, the art and craft sea sponges you get at the hobby stores. You can use any kind of sponge. Um, wrinkled up newspaper, whatever. I'm just going to use paper towel because that's what I've got handy. And I'm just going to kind of blot this guy, uh, blot around on it. So we'll go back to the overhead and blot that in before I actually go to uh, spread it around. So first I want to kind of blot it down. Because I, I want to take, you know, flatten out the big chunks, if you will. And I love the, the bright colors kind of hiding underneath the subtle colors. And I wish the light was a little bit better for you there. Uh, let me go to the end camera. You, you, get, a, you get a better look at the... Uh, now, what the colors are looking like, some, somewhat on the end camera. I may try, let me try something here, see if this makes a difference. See what, I'm going to, a little experiment here, just a paper towel for, for uh, background, see what it does to the camera. Doesn't do any good for the light. 
Here's what I'm going to try real quick. Um, I'm going to go to the end camera for a second, and I'm going to zoom this one in. If I can get there. A little bit better. It's a little out of focus because I'm not changing the focus. But there you go. So we blot down the colors. And you see how the having the the layers we're building texture just with uh, with the colorant itself. Okay. Now I'm going to start to lightly swipe at it. Not heavy, not really rubbing it, and going in, in, in random random ways. And I'm I'm trying to kind of it's a you know it's a blend, if you will. So like this blue looks really intense right in here. So we just kind of take and pull some of that around. Okay. Now remember the real hot rose red so that's kind of disappeared back in here but it's still a subtle color uh, within the piece all right the blue is pretty powerful uh, so let's go back my fingers are kind of all the same color now with the some more rose red I'll add a little bit of rose red on top of these blues and then just for yucks I'm gonna grab some of the gilt creams and See what, what kind of effect they have when I add those. So we want this to be chunky with the colors because that's our pottery. And we can make it, you know, we put more bright color on, it brightens the piece back up. And like by putting the rose red back on. Um, which I, I actually kind of like, but I like bright colors. I'm going to put some more rose red down here on the bottom. Because it, it tends to disappear pretty quickly when we, when we do our swipes here to blend the color in. I was looking at some pictures uh, of Raku pottery, and then it's a Japanese uh, art form. And I'm not, telling, I'm not trying to say that I've studied it heavily, but I saw both very structured pieces and some very random uh, pieces as well. And I want a little more pink back up here on the top. And then we're going to blend that in. How am I doing on time? 12.47. I'll go to the end camera for you. A little more rose on the top. So I think that's what you, what I saw as well, uh, Mark. And so I put that rose on the top there. I agreed with you on that one. I think it needs just a tuck, touch more. You saw my Halloween outfit. Um, all right. They're calling for more pink. And I'm with you. Uh I, I like bright colors. I like my favorite plaid suit from when I was in junior high. Right, Bridget? Okay. This is looking pretty cool in its own way. Again, the way I'm looking at the what the monitor is showing... And then what you're seeing in the feed and the lights hitting things, it looks a little bit different than it looks in person. You probably can't. Well, you can see the texture in that end camera pretty good. Okay. Let's, uh, for fun and the sake of experimentation, I'm going to change glove again. And I'm going to put on some gilt cream, and you'll see this cream, the gilding cream, is quite different in its texture and coloring. Now my hand's sweaty, I can't get gloves on. 
which case I'll be going to lunch with, with uh, colored fingers, which wouldn't be the first time. Because then I still the last thing I need to do is I want to, I want to do some powders on here. So I don't want to get too carried away uh, in my time. Looks like I got about ten minutes, give or take, um, because the the powder colors have an, uh, an effect as well. Over top of all of this, just say no to the plaid suits. What fun is that, honey? Okay, so let me get uh, these accent paste covered back up here real quick. I'm going to put them back away. That's all the accent paste I'm going to put on. For, for now, and you can see I don't know how, how it looks against the gray wall. I step back another way. Yeah, it's kind of far away. But let's get these closed up. It's really fun to play with. I mean, this is, you can mess with this stuff all day. You can do so much different, uh, so many different things and play with it. Um, I'm going to use, I'm not sure any of these, I don't have all the gilt cream colors here. I only have four that were in, in the room this morning. This is the antique brass, and I'm going to put it up on the top here. So let me go to the end camera, get my glove fitting properly. And it's, uh, it just takes a little teeny, teeny, teeny bit, okay? And this glove's not fitting like I want it to. It did come from Harbor Freight. No offense to any Harbor Freight fans. So if I add that in, it doesn't overpower. It's, it's much thinner than the accent paste. So we can use that as a subtle. Now the more you wipe things, the more they blend together, okay? Something we need to keep in mind. So that is, I mean, I like the, the shimmer and everything that's going on in here. And again, that light shining on it makes it a little bit hard for you to see. Now, let's play with some powders before I run out of time. All right. Um, I hope I didn't stick my head in the way. Iridescent green. So this powder is white. Okay. I'm going to take a little brush. And just dip it right in. Right in here, dry brush. And I'm just looking for a subtle, let's put it right in, in here. And I'm not going everywhere with it. It's gonna give us a, another different shimmer. Okay, put that back in there, I'm gonna take my My big uh, dusting makeup brush, and I'm just going to start to kind of blend that all in. Then we pick up another shimmer. It's very, very subtle. Okay. And I'm going to go down on the body and go to the overhead for you with that as well. So let me go to the overhead. It makes for just a, a real subtle shimmer, and you might see it, you might probably see it the best right in here. So I'm just going to come in, and I'm just dropping it on here. And then I'm going to take that really soft brush. All right, put that off to the side. This stuff is to me is fantastic because it gives us uh, all the iridescence in the reflections uh, without any buildup. 
with any body to it. Okay, but we pick up, so you can see how we're picking up that green with, even though the powder was, is white. All right. So you can work with this, and I'm going to grab another one because I love this stuff. It gives it that glazed look. Uh, it's the best way that I can kind of describe it. So that was a iridescent green, a pearl irid pearlescent iridescent green. And another one I want to put on here, if I can find the iridescent copper or gold, iridescent gold. Again, it looks white. Okay. And again, I'm just kind of dropping it on, dusting it, if you will. Set that back off. Then we're still in the overhead. I think using the pearl powders as the last last stage uh, really adds uh, that copper shimmer, sparkle. And again, if you overdid it, if you got too much uh, pearl powder to it, let me switch to the end. You can always come back and, and recoat it with your, your waxes. And like say I, I I've got a spot of blue. Let's say I have I see a spot of blue right here on the top that I just think is a little strong. I mean, not much, but I just want to come in here and, and see if I can't kind of take the edge off of that. So the blue is still there. So you can kind of come back and spot, Spotify, if you have something that's a little too strong and just take the edge off a little bit with the powders. Okay. And then if you wanted your solid colors, uh, those are both iridescents, which are the whites. If I was to grab a solid color of, I've got a bronze there. Here's a little pearl blue. All right, now let's see what happens. We're going to go up top with this blue. So we're going to jump up here. Oop, wrong camera still. Jump up on here. Drop in a little bit of blue because we have that other blue in our in our accent paste. And dust it in. So, you know, layer after layer after layer of color and ever so subtle. A little spot that like I say maybe I don't like that that being quite that strong. I still have it, but it takes the edge off of it. And I think I think I'm gonna stop right about there. Um, that's got a lot of the look. Now I would I'll let this dry and I'm gonna leave it in the overhead while I talk to you for a second. And I'll just kind of keep turning it. I would let this dry. Uh, let the waxes and the, and the, uh, the gilt. It's mostly wax on the accent paste wax. I would let that dry overnight. And then I would come in with uh, the WRU20 uh, water urethane. It would look just like this. I don't think it will take the sheen away at all. Uh, everything I've done with it is just kind of a neutral. I think it would be pretty cool. All right. Um, I mean, I'm really happy with this kind of stuff. It's fun. It's creative. Right? This was, I mean, this was great. It was fun. It was a little teeny piece of wood. Uh, a good experiment. I'm really happy with this. Uh, Bridget, you want this piece? You want me to finish it and bring it in the house for you later tomorrow? So I'm going to take it off the lathe here. Nah, I got it plenty tight on there. 
uh, you've got such a rainbow of these metallic colors and iridescence. And again, you know, you might have a spot you don't like. You know, it's a little too much one color or whatever. Um, I'm trying to find the best way. The light makes it so hard to show. Uh, the last thing it looks like, though, is a piece of wood. And I was over, I was on the wrong camera, dummy. Let me go. I was trying to show you this. So you get all those subtle, subtle colors. And I learned this in my dye work. Um, I would put all kinds of colors on sometimes, and then I just didn't like it. And I would dye it black. I'd put black dye over top of all the other colors. And you could still see very subtly those other colors underneath the black. And the pieces would be just awesome. And you'd look at them and you'd go, what color is that, you know? So that, I mean, this, this work came out really well. I think the shape is, you know, it's, it's what it is. Um, it's a quick piece. We'll set it right up on there. Let it kind of sit there not crooked, too crooked. It's got a little bottom on it there, a little spot. It won't sit flat for me if I want it to. <laughs> so it might be leaning a little bit to the crooked, but that's, that's okay. Um, super fun. I had a great time. Again, remember, uh, in the Spirecraft shop today, if you go to Colorants, let me pop you on there real quick. Uh, use the, the discount code COLOR. Uh, everything in the color category, color category is 15% off today. Get you some of these accent paste and the gilt creams and the pearlescent powders. There's about like 16 of each of these different kinds of colors, lots of different ones. And you can make fun stuff like this. It's not hard. Uh, it bugs me that's not straight up and down. Uh, it's easy to do. It's creative. Uh, it's very rewarding uh, when you make the pieces. So help yourself. Just like uh, uh, Art, if Art, you're still in here. Yep, I'm, Art did a piece after my window bowl last week, and he sent me the pictures. I'm going to post them uh, here as soon as I can. I've just been all tied up on the website. Uh, make a piece. If anybody will, you know makes a piece like this, and you'll send me the pictures. I'll post them in Inspirecraft. Uh, I love showing people's work that they got inspired by by being out here, or me being out here and uh, doing Monday Methods with you. So uh, send me your pictures. Show me what you did. Uh, I love to see it. Now, every time that somebody sends me something or even sends me a note, says, hey, I got inspired and I went and made a piece because of your, your Monday methods, that makes my day. All right? That's what I'm here for. Makes me happy. Makes it worth all the work that, that I do uh, that's not here, that's behind the scenes and all that stuff. So please share your work. I have a wonderful time doing this. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's now a couple of minutes after 1.00. Uh, it's been a great day. I'm going to look at here and see everybody and say thank you, and thank you, Frank, and thank you, Joe, Art, uh, Mark, Brian. Uh, I can't scroll back up without my remote. Everybody, have a safe week. Be sure you vote tomorrow, all that good stuff. I will see you next week. Uh, take care. Be safe. And I'm going to leave you with the store page as I fade away. See you next week.